Hello and welcome back to Logical Magic, Examining Esoterica. Hey guys, today I have a holiday episode for you because this is going up on July 4th because I release on Thursdays. And when I, whenever there's a holiday on a release date, what I usually do is a trailer of upcoming episodes. I'll be talking a little bit about that, but today's episode is really about avoiding fraud in the psychic community, in the tarot card community, in the spiritual medium community as well. Because unfortunately, like any other industry, there are going to be great and ethical people uh, in this particular field, and I've had a lot of them on my podcast. There are really, really good people with a tremendous amount of integrity involved in this particular art form. Having said that, like any other walk of life, there are people who will be looking to exploit the grief, the pain, the heartbreak, and sometimes the hope of the people on the other side of this. And how do we recognize the red flags? What are the most common ones? That's the things I'm going to be talking about. It's going to be a pretty brief one, but it'll hopefully give you some information that'll help keep you safe in your travels throughout spirituality. Um, before I get started, you can find me at attherisingmoon.com to book me for a tarot card reading or a life coaching session. Um, you can also find me at Chromecast at the Rising Moon on my YouTube channel. That's where the video versions of these episodes go up. And then I have a Patreon where I do weekly and monthly readings. I also teach tarot in reverse. Um, there's a lot of spirit guide messages through that. Everybody in this particular field, everybody has to make a living. Absolutely everybody does. Um, it is not the mark of a good psychic to be poor, <laughs> like, but by the same token, the mark of a good psychic is that they let you guide your own journey. The other day, part of what inspired this particular episode was I received an email solicitation and I, I get them a lot to offer collaborations, to offer to have me feature products. And the only ones I've ever done are things having to do with tarot card decks because I legitimately might buy that anyway and I don't have a problem talking about the decks that are sometimes sent to me. Um, whenever I do, I let it be known that, hey, this was given to me as a gift, but I do recommend it. Um, that's the, usually the only type of collaboration that I get. But as a, for instance, I've been offered like a lot of like hair removal things. And it's like, do you have any idea what I even do? Um, the, the other day I got one for a, a brand from eyeglasses, you know, offering me their eyeglasses. If I would talk, I'd turn that one down too. But the one I'm specifically talking about was a collaboration through, I do not know this particular astrologist. I'm not going to be calling them out by name. But it was somebody trying to solicit me for a collaboration in which I would refer people to them and that they would give me a fairly substantial amount of money per referral. It was $44, $44 and 44 cents. So, you know, designed to have that angel number attached to it. And in fact, the service that they were offering me for free to be able to see if I wish to collaborate with them. Also, it was $222 for free just for me. They may be completely legitimate, but I don't, uh, I had, there were red flags within that missive and I kind of wanted to discuss them. Please be aware in the psychic community, particularly for astrologists. Now there are astrologists I absolutely recommend and they have been on this podcast. Andy Bellotti is one, Bethany Nicole is another. These are people I know well and I know they're very ethical. And um, one of the things you need to be aware of with astrologists, even the very ethical ones, is that they are going to need sensitive information about you in order to be able to do their job. They're going to need your time and place of birth. And you need to start being very careful when you give out that information with any other details that you add in with that. Meaning that uh, the solicitation that came towards me, which was a little bit like a multi-level marketing scheme, um, actually asked for enough information about me. I was I was literally dumbfounded as I'm reading through the list of all the information. They're like, hey, take this free service and all you need to give us is enough information to perpetrate identity theft. <laughs> it, there was, it was really not subtle. They wanted my name at birth. They wanted the place I was born and the time I was born enough to actually request a copy of my birth certificate. It was really, 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 I was astounded by how much information they were asking for. I did not reply to them. I won't reach out to them. They had uh, an instance of somebody on Instagram who I'd never heard of who was uh, collaborating with them. These are all red flags. If somebody, don't go for cold contacts on this. As Jacob, who's been on my podcast a ton of times, says, we won't cold call you. And that is true. Almost every tarot card reader, psychic, and medium that you ever see on the uh, in social media 
will have somebody in usually a different country, usually one of the African nations, where um, one of the ways that they support themselves is through uh, kind of organized fraud against more wealthy countries, wealthier countries. And I'm not judging that. I have never been that poor. I've never been that desperate. But what I am saying is that you need to be aware that it is a, po it is a possibility within this particular realm. People have cloned me and tried to impersonate me and tried to uh, sell people readings in their in my own comment section pretending to be me. And good luck pretending to be me because honest to goodness, I express myself in a very particular and an individual way. It wouldn't last very long. Having said that, I've always wondered how many of my actual clients have fielded a direct message or another reach out from an entity that has cloned me trying to pretend to be me. Um, not a lot's gone back to me on that. I think people, I am individual enough that it is really difficult to impersonate me. But that is something that you need to be aware of. Real readers, people who are actually trustworthy, are not going to reach out to you saying, I feel guided to give you a reading, but I do charge. They will not do that. They will not do that. We really all do believe that the clients that are meant for us come to us. It's why I can have people who are te technically my competition on the podcast, and I've been on other readers' podcasts as well. And most of us don't worry about it at all because who's meant for you will come to you, etc. No cold calling, no direct messages. If you're on somebody's video and somebody appears to be them, starts talking to you about, they always operate through WhatsApp, so be aware of that. The email solicitations where they ask for, be very careful with the information that you give to even an astrologist you trust, because remember, if they don't have the security measures in place to protect your sensitive data, it is actually a risk. So one of the things you need to be aware of is that you don't actually need to give an astrologist your birth name. You don't. Um, do you have to give them the place and the time of your birth? They do have to pinpoint your uh, your time zone, so you can always fudge by saying the adjacent state if you're really, really, really cautious. But the better move is to go through people who come to you through a recommended and a trusted source. And to remember that you should extend trust appropriately to people over the course of an extended relationship. When it comes to tarot card readings, sometimes people aren't aware that they are accidentally um, perpetuating uh, kind of a hopeful situation in someone's life. Because here's something that does not get talked about in the tarot card community. If you are trying to conduct a relationship through tarot where you haven't been in contact with the person, but you're wondering, are they coming back? Are they going to reach out? That is the prime area to understand that even a really ethical reader may not know that there is an attachment on the other side of that. Meaning that if there is no actual future, what the reader will see is what you're hoping for what you're imagining. It's called a hopes and fears scenario. And I've seen a lot of people get caught in it where a reader after a reader or after a reader, they pick up on your energy. That's what we do. We look into your energy to tell you what's in your future. If nothing's there, the cards have a really hard time reflecting this is done. Nothing's going to happen after this. They can frequently tap into your hopes, your imagination on this. And so even a good reader can get caught in accidentally perpetuating what's called a hopes and a fear scenario. They'll usually catch it almost right away. They usually will. One of the cards that you need to be aware of if you are caught in that situation, which is completely normal. It means that you have unfinished business with that energy. It doesn't mean you're delusional or crazy. It means that you're still resolving an energy around trying to have closure on something in which you did not achieve emotional satisfaction. That's the easiest way to put it. The Seven of Cups is the card that you will, co will, ha will come down on, on the Four of Wands in reverse, but not everybody reads reversals. But the Seven of Cups in the upright is a fantasy and illusion card. If that is present in the tarot card readings that you're getting, know that you may be involved in a hopes and a fear scenario, and even a really good reader may not know that that's, what hap that's happening. It took me a while doing this professionally to understand that it could happen, and that's what explained a scenario in which Someone who had incredible willpower, and this was a friend, it was not a client, it was a friend, um, uh, who had incredible willpower, had me read on a situation over and over again, and she was going to multiple readers to have it read. Um, kept telling her that somebody that she hoped to return would return. 
And it was because this person had such tremendous focus and it's what she wanted so badly that it came out the energy, because we're reaching into your energy, was determined by the client. And a lot of us were getting these like, oh, this person is going to return. It's all going to be rosy and you're like, you'll be together and you'll get married, that type of thing. Um, and so one day I was talking to her on the phone and I used to have a habit of shuffling and putting out cards when I was on um, the phone because I was actually trying to increase my ability to shuffle and talk at the exact same time because I have to do it all the time. I'll be completely frank. I was trying to hone a skill and I was talking to her. She wasn't focused on me. I put down the cards and it indicated he was never coming back and he was going to move in with another person and marry another person. And in fact, that is what happened. But the only time I ever got a clear read on that was when her she was distracted from her focus. Please remember, your focus, if you have extreme focus, can start, it's the only answer you will hear. And so it can come through the cards. But that's not to blame anybody for anything. It's just be aware. It, one of the red flags around that is getting reading after reading after reading after reading to try and perpetuate a relationship that is not in the 3D. And that's your first red flag. If somebody is not in your 3D life, like get a reading to figure out what's going on with them if you really want. Because sometimes that happens. Sometimes we're all like, hey, what happened to this person from the past? And you have a reader you trust. You have them take a look. Chances are they're getting really, really accurate answers if you're not highly invested in it emotionally. But if you are, if it's a bad breakup, if it's a ghosting situation, uh, limit yourself on the number of readings that you will get and try to let go as much because that's always the answer in uh, any form of uh, separation uh, relationship. Though sometimes people do come back. I mean, it's not unheard of. It's just that you need to focus on your own journey and to do your work and to focus on your own. Don't put yourself on a shelf and wait for anybody. Whenever you do, know that that hyper-focus can impact your tarot card readings. But we're talking more about deliberate fraud. We've talked about the scammers who will pretend to be other readers in comment sections. And sometimes they'll get a hold of email addresses. Remember, it's really easy to clone somebody's number and email address, etc. And you are very unlikely to notice the very subtle changes. As I said, it's all, I would I would be I don't think anybody could pretend to be me. All of my clients have like enough direct contact with my voice and the way that I uh, phrase things that there no one's ever going to be able to perpetrate that fraud. But the thing is, is that I don't think they actually give the readings. I don't have a lot of experience with what the DM uh, fraudsters are doing. Um, I don't think they actually give the reading. I think they just take the money and run. Um, so you need to be aware of that, that it is a craft that can be performed via Zoom and on the internet and via uh, a phone call almost better than it can in person. Because in person, you're overcoming somebody's physical protective energy, and it can be very draining. I do very few in-person reads now because of that, because they're about 50 times more draining than the Zoom readings are. And they are as accurate, but they require a lot more energy from me. So I do have to charge more for it, and so I do limit the number that I do. So red flags in readers who are, they're not trying to do anything terrible, but like they have their own concerns to look out for. Um, anybody who tries to sell you an expensive service uh, and, and a first reading, telling you that you're cursed. Sometimes people are cursed, but a reputable reader will help you work on releasing the energy first before trying to sell you any type of spell or energy breaking. Um, any third party situation in which they begin telling you that the person's like uh, other person, the person that they may be with, is casting black magic against you. That's a red flag. You want to you want to get a second opinion. Never be afraid to get a second opinion. That's probably the easiest way to find out if somebody who is suggesting a service to you, um, it, you really need it, is go to somebody else. And again, if you're listening to my podcast and you likely have been encountering psychics and spirit mediums through podcasts and just go with the people that you trust, it's very rare for us to actually put up an interview with somebody that we don't have full confidence in. So that's another thing is to remember that that little bit of a buffer can help. Now, I do have people who are referred to me for demonic entity removal. I do a form of exorcism I have for years at this particular point. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm not too afraid to do something on fraud because like I invoked Kali earlier today. So like, be aware if you come at me, something's coming back at you <laughs> and, and you're not going to like it. So probably just don't. And it took me years to be able to accept that I needed to do more defensive magic because I don't do baneful magic. Um, 
But one of the things that you need to remember is that, like, again, somebody suggesting a spell to you upon first acquaintance, anybody who's trying to sell you extras, anybody who's trying to upsell you, that's a red flag. Wait until you know them better. Maybe they're completely legitimate, but it is one of the red flags. If you meet with somebody the first time and they have $600 worth of services that they're suggesting to you that you need to align your chakras or whatever it may be, that's a red flag and you need to be conscious of that. The most of the spell work I do is through long-term clients or people who are referred to me specifically by like other readers that I actually trust because it is known that I'm one of the people who can do attachment removals and can do demonic entity removals, but I only work through referral um, specifically because I never suggest magic to people. I They come to me for it. And it's just one of the rules I made around that because um, I was aware that so many tarot card readers uh, do try to exploit the realm of magic to up their income. I can't begrudge anybody that. Everybody's just trying to survive. Most of the time, they really are performing an actual service. But it's, you know, try to find the ways to heal your own energy first, because somebody can get an attachment off of you. But if you have not under, uh, healed the underlying issues, it's likely to come back. And so heal your underlying issues and then do start the healing process and then do the attachment removal. OK, just make sure you're doing it in the right order. All energy healers sometimes have to do more work. Make sure that you vibe with somebody, that you trust them. Um, somebody who has an awareness that, like, you know, money is a finite source in your life is also somebody that is far more likely to be trustworthy. And we're going to talk a little bit about psychic lines because they are the way that some people can, on demand, access psychic support. Now, are they are they legitimate? Some of them are, yes, absolutely. All of the lines I've ever worked for, because when I was starting out, I had to work for lines, too. We'll test the people who work for them to make sure that they can legitimately do what they say they're going to do. Having said that, it is an industry where I did work for two lines that I did not find to be reputable. One of them is where Megumi Ho found me, which was the only, and she's been on my podcast. She would not mention mind me using her full name. I had to be in a position for her to find me because it was essential to help save her life in a situation. And I had always wondered why I needed to work for that particular site because they're they're actually known as a human trafficking site. They have all of the people on uh, the camera. Um, I was bombarded with sexual requests the entire time I was there and told that other people were doing it. And it was it was a very, very strange atmosphere. I was very glad to leave it behind. Another line that I worked for briefly, that was another situation where I needed to be there very briefly. They literally said to me, keep them talking after they tested me. Remember, keep them talking. Remember, those lines are frequently out to exploit you and your need for answers and to try and find a psychic in person that you trust, that you can work with via Zoom. It does not have to be face to face, but it has to be reliably the same person. And they're going to have at least reasonable fees. And I'm not saying anything against those line psychics because some of them are truly gifted and some of them are worth the money. But you need to be very careful in that realm and to be aware that addiction is also present sometimes in tarot reading. It can be a compulsive activity. Getting answers to the unknown can feel so soothing to people, particularly with anxiety or depression, that they seek out answer after answer after answer. And that's where we go to be careful with the lines. There is one I will recommend, and they're not paying me, but I did work for them at one point. Um, they have no idea I'm about to mention them. It's Mystic Sense. They, I know they have a high standard. They monitor their psychics for fraud. So they're not going to let anybody charge you more for energy clearings. They can't log out and then log in at a higher rate for different services, which is something that is well known on the lines. So I know they monitor their psychics for uh, good intent and they're decent human beings. Um, I started with them when they started their line. I don't work for any lines any longer, but they're the ones that I'm very comfortable uh, recommending because I know they do have standards for their psychics. So everybody might have a, hey, it's two o'clock in the morning. I would really, really like an answer to this because it feels like an emergency. That's the line I'd recommend um, because I, I know them to have ethical management practices. It's just that simple. Um, does that mean that all the other lines don't? No, I don't have experience with all the lines. I did not find them to be, I, it's not my form of reading. It's mostly relationship reading. And I do do relationship reading, but for the most part, I do healing reading, empowerment reading, life's purpose reading. Um, I help people resolve their trauma and their underlying issues as my primary focus in reading, because I feel like it's the most effective tool for tarot, that it helps the most. Anybody can give you the answers. I help give people the solutions. And it's just kind of that easy or so simple for me. Um, what, what else do I want to talk about? Oh, YouTube. 
Um, hey, listen, YouTube is best approached as a form of entertainment. I do readings on YouTube. Sometimes people connect to me for deep healing work because I don't do uh, particularly commercialized or romanticized readings. But there are a lot of people who do. There's a reader who, like, I don't begrudge her any of this. I've still got her alerts that come across my um, For You page and onto my phone and things. And the titles of it, I call them, um, they're, they're, they're basically bait. Um, you know, they can't stop thinking about you. They're going to reach out. They're the thing that will appeal to your desire. And there's nothing wrong with that. Just know that it's a little bit like eating a cookie. It's something to make you feel better, but don't overinvest in it. And some of them are incredibly good readers. There are great readers on YouTube. Um, get personal readings with people if you really, really want to know the answers. And those pick a cards, remember, they work with your intuition, not the psychics. Meaning the psychic is connecting to a real energy. But when you see it, you will be drawn to the things that either you want or have the answers for you. And it's not always the same thing. And the thing that you want is not always the thing that's going to happen. And so to keep that in mind, pick a card's hold a place, but use them for healing journeys because they'll really help you more. For specific details, it's very difficult to get that in a general setting. Some people do, some people don't. YouTube readings are the ones that approach it with caution and know that there are tremendously good and tremendously ethical people out there, but that it is more about, remember, it can appeal to a part of you that has to do with attachments. And so be just very careful to keep an eye on it for codependent tendencies or a tendency to be compulsive. Compulsivity and trauma go hand in hand. It has to do also with a damaged sacral chakra. And I'm going to leave off with the last thing that I think is really important for people to know around fraud within this industry. Oh, wait, no, the second to last thing. Let me cover um, spirit mediums first. I have had multiple spirit mediums on, and I am actually a spirit medium. Even though I do not advertise myself that way, I only do one particular form of spirit mediumship, and that is to help spirits uh, relieve themselves of a karmic burden or to achieve closure for the client. Because... Even incredibly good spirit mediums can accidentally perpetuate a healing cycle and in order to, like, it, you have trouble moving on. You have trouble moving on um, because you're trying to conduct a relationship with somebody who's no longer in their corporeal form. And what you need to understand about most spirits is that if they have resolved their karmic burden, they move on. It doesn't mean you're abandoned. You will always feel their love and their essence because we are actually infinite. The whole thing where C.S. Lewis said, you do not have a soul, you are a soul, you have a body. Please remember that. The body goes away, the soul stays around, but the soul is no longer contained by the body. And that we do move forward with our consciousness, that we are meant to conduct the most of the bulk of our relationships with the living because we are living. And it is very difficult to receive the love, support, and emotional resonance from uh, an incorporeal form. And then in its worst incarnation, unfortunately, it is the realm where people have been known to encounter the most fraud. Uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes mysteries, and then actually Harry Houdini, were also both were very famous for debunking spirit mediums and people claiming to get people in touch with someone on the other side. Conan Doyle did it because I believe he lost a son. I'm not positive. It might have been I think it was son or a nephew in one of the world wars. And so uh, it was preyed upon by a lot of spirit mediums and began debunking them. Harry Houdini uh, really wanted to connect with his mother on the other side. They had a very complex and clearly codependent relationship. And he left behind a series of things for his wife that if she ever saw these signs, he was trying to get in touch with her. Um, but it is one of the, there are very, very ethical spirit mediums. The, anyone who's ever been on my show, I believe to be a really ethical person, and they really are in touch with things and uh, with the people uh, beyond the this living uh, existence. But the, to be par uh, careful when uh, conducting a relationship with someone who is no longer among the living, to remember that it goes through a human vessel, and it's a little bit like playing telephone. Things get lost in translation, and to try and resolution and letting go and healing and grieving is really the goal. And if you need a spirit medium for that, that is absolutely fine. But be careful of the type of spirit medium who will perpetuate a relationship far beyond the grave. 
I've known people who talk to spirit mediums to talk to dead spouses or relatives for literal years after the person died because they were having trouble with their grieving process and letting go felt too threatening to them. And how much of that was accurate, I, I don't know. I don't know. How much of it was in the hopes and the fears scenario, I don't know. I'm just saying it's one of the areas that you need to practice extreme caution. Um, and then um, I've kind of lost my place on what I thought the other thing was going to be important to talk about. So it can't have been that important. Um, oh, I do know what it was. One of the things that really drew my attention to potential fraud within this industry is remember that it is a culture in which like you have to put yourself out there. You do have to try, but be very, very on your guard, very careful with anyone who approaches you and says, I've read your aura, you have a this, this part of you needs to be aligned, this part of you needs to be healed, and you're not approaching them. If you're not making first contact, always be a little bit wary of that. Because years ago, I did have somebody contacting me, and I didn't follow up with them because I did not get a vibe, good vibe from them, who was texting me saying, hey, I met you at a party, you gave me your card and said I needed my chakras so on. And I was like, I most certainly did not. <laughs> that's, that's not something that I do. Um, and to please be a little bit like concerned about somebody trying to sell them something. That, which is really what they're talking about in a social situation, that they may have been there, in fact, to try and drum up some business, and there's nothing wrong with that, but to, to be very careful if they request a lot of money during that first reading that to treat that as a red flag. And so that was the last one I wanted to leave off with, is sometimes um, you will meet somebody who then tells you, you know, you need to get this, you need to get that, you need to do this perpetual work with me. And I have such a hard time assigning dark motives to people, but sometimes they exist. And you need to be aware of that. This is an industry where it is amazing. You can find out that there is more beyond this world. You can find out that magic clearly exists when somebody can put down their, your cards and tell you about things that you haven't told them about. There is a form of magic in this world that we can interact with. But where there is magic, there can be manipulation. And to be very careful going forward. And this is July 4th in the United States. That is Independence Day. Part of healing from codependence is independence. Part of independence is being able to be self-protective. This is one of the realms that you want to be very cognizant of your ability to be self-protective. It doesn't mean not trusting people. It means trust them as they earn your trust. And it's not, even really good people are not meant to work with you sometimes. I had a spell consult referral. When I put down the cards, it's like, well, she clearly needed this particular spell, but I also saw she actually wasn't going to work with me. And I accepted that as being this person is in a very slightly different collective. Now, she did actually book me for the spell, but when I, I, when I reached out to her to follow up, she had changed her mind. And she was referred to me for a particular attachment energy. But when in the cards, I really did see that it's like, I'm not the right call for this person. I kind of kept talking to her about it. It's fine if you don't want to do this. It's fine if you don't want to do this. Because I already knew that like a part of her just didn't want to do it. She was too concerned about like what it might do to uh, a situation within her life. And I really can't go into it anything more than that. So with those were zero identifying details. Whenever I bring up anything having to do with a client, I'm very cognizant. I'm very aware that I need to protect their privacy. I'm usually changing at least one detail or using something so broad that literally the only person who might know I'm talking about them is the actual person. And to please examine the information that I've just given for, did I even use one identifying thing? I'm trying to use your experience not to gossip about you, but to try and help other people because we are all part of a community. And sometimes I'm sure people have to talk about me because one of the things as I was recovering from a toxic relationship was I did get false returns on something that I was very hopeful around. And I, I was and recognizing it in another person's card is what freed me from it in my own life. Being able to understand that it's like, okay, wishful thinking sometimes plays a part in this particular realm and that to be aware of that. Just to be aware of that. Awareness is the thing that can help you the most. Never commit to something you're uncomfortable with within a reading. Wait a full day. Wait 24 hours. Ground. Um, make sure you eat something healthy. Make sure you do something balancing like exercising, taking a walk in the park, and then decide. 
never give in to pressure within an initial meeting in particular. And it, there's a slight, are there any provisos on that? Yes. Like I've had people book me for a spell consult where the entire thing is they've reached out to me. I want this done. We're going to have a meeting to make sure it precisely what I need to put into a working in order to get them the results that they want. And I usually send people supplemental recordings to work on the energy as much as they can to achieve that. You're doing your healing work and I'm going to do the, I'm going to get it away from you with a sledgehammer and then you're going to repour your foundation, fill in the cracks, make sure it can't get back to you. And all of that stuff has a tendency to be free with resources that I use through places like YouTube. Um, okay, so that was avoiding fraud in the spiritual community in tarot card reading in spirit mediumship. Please understand that to anybody out there who's a reader, I'm not calling you a fraud and I never would. I'm just saying that we're all aware that it exists and that when we really care about our clients, we want to make sure they're protected. And then one last word for anybody who might be listening because it's like, wait, what's she telling people? I invoked Kali and I genuinely, genuinely would not uh, advise uh, trying to act out against me for this particular recording or for anything because I really did start to have to double down on protection and put a lot of, listen, whatever you throw at me is coming right back at you. And I figured out a way to be karmically clear on that because I do work with pure intent towards my clients. And that is one of the things that um, you're not allowed to interfere with that particular work in a spiritual realm. It's like being a medic on a war, uh, a war field, you know, you're not supposed to shoot at them. So don't shoot at me or something's going to shoot back. <laughs> That's basically the proviso on that. This has been Logical Magic Examining Esoterica, an uncharacteristically short episode. If you want to find me, at therisingmoon.com is the only way to book me. And then you can find me on YouTube at Chromecast at the Rising Moon. I do have a lot of like attachment readings, et cetera. They do give you actionable information, but try not to look for predictive tarot too much in those pick a cards because your individual details are your individual details. And it's unlikely to come from a pick a card scenario. It can tell you the shape and the form of the energy around you, but always follow up with a reading with a reader that you trust. And it does not have to be me, but hold people to a standard of Assuming that they will, that they have your best interest in mind, but assume always that it's okay, that no ethical person will ever be offended by the thought that you're trying to protect yourself. They will understand, yeah, go sit, think about this. Anybody who ever pressures you for something is immediately a red flag. And then in astrology in particular, be super aware of how much information you're giving them as a, for instance, again, they don't need your full birth name in order to do your chart. They need the details of your geographic birth, but they do not need your birth name to do the work that they are doing. Okay. Be aware of that. And if anybody is asking for that and is ethical, remind them, if you are not taking the protective practices around protecting my information, I should never get it to you. And I guess I will share the one story before I actually really do sign off that really brought this into the fore of my consciousness about six months ago. Someone I actually do know locally um, wanted me to come and teach classes at a facility that they had purchased. And um, when they reached out to me via email, um, they included, hey, just fill out this form. And I swear to God, I asked for my social security number. I laughed for like five minutes straight. And I was like, I am never, ever, ever going to share this information in an unsecured format via email. What are you thinking? And they laughed too. They just hadn't really even thought of that. Half the time, the person on the other end of this is not actually even thinking about like, oh my God, that is somebody's sensitive information. People, it's easy to spot the people with integrity because they're not uncomfortable discussing the risk ratio with anything that they're doing. So that's another thing is it be perfectly, you're never offending somebody by being self-protective. And if you are, that is a red flag in and of itself. Okay. Take care, be well, live magically and walk through these realms carefully and you will have a magical experience while here. Take care, be well.